everyone, and welcome back to the Unrestricted Podcast. I'm Maddie Stunts, your host, and you're also joined by um, Chad Capper. Hello, this is Chad. And Drew Camden, hey a.k.a. Madrid. What's going on? And someone who doesn't make it onto many podcasts that much, but probably, in my eyes, one of the biggest figures in the in the drone business industry and um uh, a personal idol of mine uh tim nielsen from lumineer hi guys thanks for the intro maddie welcome yeah, tim no- thanks for taking the time out of i know you have a very busy schedule and uh really appreciate you coming on tim definitely i'm, I'm happy to so, so we're gonna ask maybe, you some uh, hard you- we're going to ask oh, go you ahead, some sir. hard questions, so I hope you're ready. Hard questions? Oh, God. <laughs> well, let, let's start easy. Maybe just, just tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do at Lumineer to get FPV, right? For, sure. for those of our audience that may have not heard of you. Um, sure. So, you know, the companies I run, one is called Get FPV, which is um, one of the largest um, specialty retailers in the drone, FPV, drone racing space. Um, and the other company is Lumineer, and Lumineer is our brand um, that designs and manufactures um, drone equipment really with a focus towards what I call the powertrain, propellers, and motors. But we do lots of things. You know, we basically have you know, any piece that you would find on a drone, especially a racing drone, there's a Lumineer component for it. We make a lot of LiPos, uh, we make airframes like the QAVR. Um, and really everything in between, we make a very popular um, FPV antenna like the, the Axie antenna line. So that's Lumineer. And the two businesses, obviously, there's a lot of um, relationship between the two companies. They help each other, of course. Get FPV, for example, distributes Lumineer products to other retailers. Um, but that's sort of how the companies are set up. Okay. And I, uh, if you want, I can t- tell you a little bit about how I started this um, this crazy journey. Um, which is always a good story, I think. People like yeah, to- I think I think a lot of especially newcomers into the industry don't realize the 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 magnitude of uh, you know the the way that you brought the business and the availability to supply um, these drones or not d- drones, but like you know FPV gear in general to the general public. Because it was very, it was at the very beginning, it was a really, you know, um, underground thing. And I even remember when I first started getting into it, uh, which was about two and a half years ago. It was still then really hard to find information and, and fa- find uh, businesses to sell stuff. And my first purchase was with Lumineer at the very beginning. Great, thank you for that. Yeah, it was, look, I mean, it has, the whole hobby has, is not that old, right? It's not like some existing hobby like, whatever, golfing or cycling or, you know, that's been in existence for decades. <clears throat> FPV is still so new, and I started really pursuing the, the space um, only maybe five, six years ago you know, when I got into it, and I was working at Sony at the time. I sold my first startup to Sony. Um, and I was the chief technology officer for Sony Music at the time and um, bumped into FPV. You know, I, my first video that I saw was a trappy video of him flying in New York City. I lived in New York City at the time. So it was like, mate, had a huge impact. Like I was sitting there watching Is the, the video. The Team like, Black Sheep video? That's right. Of him flying awesome. the wing, the Zephyr uh, in Manhattan. And I was just... I was done, you know, this to me was like, well, that's what I'm going to do. I, yeah. don't, I didn't know what that meant yet, but I said, this has, to me, is so compelling, you know, combining flight and media, you know, my whole career I spent in, in media, in the music media segment um, and digital at that. So it's just like it hit me immediately and I knew I had to find a way to, to do something in that space. And that's how I started and eventually started making a tricopter out of my two-bedroom apartment in Manhattan. Uh, Wait, no, so when you say you immediately knew you had to do something in that space, you did that mean you immediately wanted to participate in the hobby or you knew immediately, I want to start a business in this space? Well, I think the two goes, to me, the two go hand in hand. If I'm really excited about something, 
I get so involved at such a deep level that often, and it was like that in my first business that I sold, I got so deeply involved and I started thinking about it at such a deep level that I immediately start about thinking, well, what kind of products would I want to make? What kinds of services would I think are valuable to, you know, and valuable to, to consumers like me? You know, what would I want to do? So that's how I, you know, started thinking about it. And, and, you know, the tricopter was one of those first things that, you know, I knew, uh, David, you know, obviously, you, you know, he, Chad, you're speaking so of, close to. Yeah, David Vindestal from Sweden. Um, who right. actually made the Tricopter platform popular. Uh, exactly. And I watched David's work, and, and I felt, you know what, Th there needs to be something there that is makes it easy to build one of these Tricopters. And David did a lot of good work, I, and this is like way before, you know, any of what we're now facing with FPV and, and racing and everything else had, had taken hold. It was David building his his Tricopters on, on YouTube and I felt, you know, that there needs to be a kit that people can just buy and put the stuff together more easily. So I started working on one and started selling. It was very popular, and that's how I sort of got into product development in the early days. So is this this is this the same David that um, that sent his plane up to this? Yeah. Oh stuff yeah. Here? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Che definitely okay. check out. RC Explorer, that's David Wind Vin I can't ever say his Vindestal. last name. The Sweden David. Uh, he does all sorts of crazy things. He sent uh, RC planes up into space. He does all sorts of crazy freestyle with tricopters. And more recently, he has a series called Rocket Knife. Rocket Knife. Yeah. So I won't even say anything beyond that. Just go check it out. <laughs> so David's I, a great, I great wanna friend. I want to go back to that for a second, Tim, because you, you skipped over some of our early relationship stuff. And uh, so when I first met Tim, he was still CTO at Sony, uh, Sony Music. And uh, I remember him posting his Tricopter video at somewhere near Central Park. I think it was a, a monument there. Yeah. You're probably flying illegally. Um, I flew in New York City uh, illegally, both in Riverside Park, which is a big park, on the west side of town um, that stretches up sort of the whole west west side and then also in Central Park. I, you know, I, I have videos that I've since taken down <laughs> being a smarter man now than I was. Are, are you going to ask us to edit this part out? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you allegedly had some videos in Central Park, right? Somebody said. So. Um, I do not recall. Um, <laughs> there we but go. yes, I mean, this was when, you know, this was the time when I was so getting so into the hobby that I was, I had to fly every day, you know, and I lived in the, on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Well, you got to have to somehow get your fix. So I found places to fly in, in Central Park and Riverside Park. And if you were to do that today, you would be shut down within minutes if not faster than that obviously there's a big fear in, in manhattan rightfully so i mean we've all heard about people doing not so smart things with phantoms in in manhattan and i understand why that needs to be you know controlled right so, so you got into this space before it was really widely available and it's still I, we call it widely available but it's still it's still niche right but it's it's significantly more so than when you started so what were the biggest challenges both as a pilot and as an entrepreneur in that space or was that more of an opportunity um, as an entrepreneur yeah i look any any space that's early on um that you're excited about there's a good chance that there's other people that are going to be excited about it and the question then becomes, well, what can you do to establish a business? What what will you pursue? Is it a service? Is it a product? Is it a you know a website where people can buy things? You know, that sort of comes with the territory. Then defining if you're really passionately in love with what what this thing is, you know, what you can try to to establish. And luckily for me, I was able to do a few different things. Right, we established a store that's still the um, the largest, I would say, in the U.S. to buy FPV-related gear with Get FPV, mm -hmm. and Lumineer had become, you know, has become a very significant brand, uh, well-established across a number of different product lines um, in the FPV space. So, out of necessity, you know, when we built, when we made the Stricopter, I said, well, 
I got to sell this thing someplace, you know, and I had no relationship with anybody and there wasn't any stores where you could go to that would, that would have this stuff. Um, so I decided to set up my own store, literally thought about it for five minutes, what the store should be called. I said, well, FPV should be in the name. Well, maybe get, get FPV. Yeah, that sounds good. Register it. And that would <laughs> Now your so, your first entity, Tim, was get our uh, FPV manuals, though. That's right. Yeah, I I actually forgot about that. It, it it wasn't Lumineer at the time. I don't think it was still. I was still just going to the get FPV website, right? That's right. F- Lumineer came much later. So my first foray, my first thing that I thought I could do, was to create a blog, to put together information about the hobby. And that was FPV manuals, because I felt at the time there was forms that have, since have lost a lot of steam, like FPV Lab. I don't know if you remember that, mm-hmm. um, a form where you would go and you would read about, here's you know, how people, people that are building a Zephyr, here's 400 pages of comments, um, sort of an expanded version of what we have on Facebook now in the thread comments. Um, and you would learn about how to build a Zephyr by going through 400 forum posts or 400 pages of forum posts. Yeah. Said, well, that's, that's not really that effective a way to learn about stuff. And I, my answer back in the day was to create a website, FPV manuals. But now obviously there's lots of people like, um, you know, Bradwell and others that do great, a great job of coming up with videos and flight test obviously does a ton of work um, in terms of showing you how to build stuff and, and road ride the same, the same way. I mean, lots of, Lots of entities that are really dedicated to the information about how to do things. Um, so FPV manuals quickly then became. I just didn't have enough time to do FPV manuals, get FPV, and Lumineer. <laughs> so right. FPV manuals sort of fell through, um, fell to the side, and um, you know couldn't couldn't focus on all the things. You have to pick your pick your battles as well. Yeah. No. I, well, that's awesome to hear kind of hear the story about how you're passionate about the educational aspect of that. And I mean, we know that because you, you sponsored build videos for our, for our channel, right? So yeah. it's clear that you invest in the, the education side of things. And, uh, um, I don't, I, I think that's awesome that there's real passion behind the business and that's, that's the key to success. I think. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, I would agree with you. I, you know, to this day, I fly every day, mm-hmm. every day at work. Oh, really? I, I fly. That is excellent. And people sometimes look at me and like, it's like, what's this guy doing? Like, I'm in the middle of a meeting and it's like, you know what? Um, I'll be right back. Really? <laughs> I go, I, I grab my rig. Um, I call it the Black Mamba. That's my, that's my rig. You think I'm kidding. It's like, it's, it's what it's called, Black Mamba. And it's a, uh, it's a, it's a race frame. I actually don't even have FPV gear on it because I fly line of sight um, oh, wow. with that rig. It has a super bright LED in the back of the frame and when i fly i fly um a new method that i call blos so you know line of sight los i fly blos which stands for beyond line of sight so you <laughs> use that bright led and i fly way further than you could tell which way the airframe is oriented of course not a good idea don't don't tell anybody i told you this we won't um, allegedly <laughs> allegedly <laughs> But the light is so bright that you can always orient the frame back to, to get it back. It's a lot of fun. I enjoy it, and I do it every day. Um, so I, I think it's incredibly important to stay flying and stay involved with the technology because how else are you going to make good products when you don't do what this whole thing is about anymore? So I'm, I'm very passionate about that, and I feel flying is important to – if you're in the space, in the business – you know, you gotta you gotta keep using the technology every day. So there's something I would I was looking forward to bringing up through this because obviously I know you and I know Carlos really well, but I don't think I've ever asked either of you about the beginnings of the Lumineer Sharpu relationship, and I'm sure a lot of people would like to hear that because sure. So Sharpu. Right. Introduce yep. Sharpu, Chad. So hey, he needs no introduction for most of us, but just in case, Sharpu is the what a lot of people refer to as the godfather of FPV mini quads. Um, he's 
kind of the first one that really put it on the map. Not the first one to fly it, but to really push its limits. And uh, I think the video that seems to be the milestone for almost everyone is left behind. And uh, this video is now about three years old. And if you watch it, it still holds up pretty well, you know, considering. I mean, it, it obviously, you can tell a difference in the speed and that. But given the time period that it was done, it is really a milestone. Um, yeah. And Tim, so I'm far ahead of his time. You were already connected to him prior to that, weren't you? Right. That, absolutely. So Sharper is, is, like you say, I think he's one of those people that really started a, a, a huge movement towards what what we now know as acrobatic FPV and you know he's not sharper I wouldn't consider him a racer but certainly in the FPV acrobatics he he pushed this ball forward in a, in a great way and the videos that he's that he made three years ago like you say Chad are still um, you know as groundbreaking today as they were back then and we hooked up with with Carlos really early on when because he was trying to push the limits and we were looking at his videos. And there was one video that he was one of his first where one of the things that he did in the video is he added little half, I don't know, like looks like an eggshell, right? These half rounded mounts on the bottom of these arms. And he would fly really fast and there was this little car. It was in a parking lot. He would go at full speed down on the ground, start skidding over the, the asphalt under the car and then come out on the other end and keep flying. And, you know, now that, well, I've seen that. I've done that. You know, it's like, well, but at the time, nobody had done that yet. We have a right? product it's, just for that. It's called Quad just Skids. You can pick it up. At, <laughs> wait, right. do you have it at, at, Loom, at Get FPV? Do you have the Quad Skids? We probably do. Yeah. Right. I, I think we do. We, okay. I, we definitely do. I saw them the other day. Yeah, good. Walking through the shelves. <laughs> yeah. So you can just so, buy that. <laughs> I like talking about it like it, you know, I mean, it's not that long ago, right? But at the time when he did that, it was truly unique. And Andy and I looked at this. We were at the time, I think, still sitting in the, in in my house in Florida when you know I decided to leave Sony. And I decided, I said, you know what, I'm going to do this full time. I'm going to quit my big job. I was like, you know. So where's your vlog? Where's your I quit my job vlog? That's all the rage now. Yep. All, Is it? all the I'm pilots are. Today. Putting, do, do it. <laughs> How I quit my job for FPV. How I quit my job. You know, I was, I was at the time, like I said, I was working at Sony and I was making, I worked my day job. I come home at night and I work literally another six hours at home till deep in the night (laughs) till I fell over out of being tired, like at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., go to bed, sleep for a few hours, get back up, go to my day job and do this all over again. It was incredibly tiring, but what it allowed me to do is I started building, you know, this business and started selling product out of my two bedroom apartment um, with boxes everywhere. It's crazy. And um, eventually I realized, you know what, if I really want to grow this and I really want to do this, I got to quit my job and commit to this hundred percent. And I loved it so much. And the, the growth already in the early days, it made it so clear that this is, can work. Um, that I said to my wife, it's like, look, let's just do it. You know, it's like, I'm ready for it. I was with Sony for 10 years. So I had sort of corporate life. I've been there, done that. You know, it's like, I got to do something that I really am passionate about. Again, you know, I've had obviously a startup in the past that I sold to Sony. That's how I joined them. So I knew what it was like being an entrepreneur and I knew what it's like, how enjoyable it is, even though, you know, you're always nervous every day. But it's the, 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 the thrill you get out of running your own thing. I knew I wanted to get back to it. So I said to my wife, let's do it. Where do we want to go? It's got to be somewhere warm and there has to be lots of space to fly. So we looked at California and we looked at Florida and very quickly sort of zeroed in on the west coast of Florida, the Gulf Coast, which is where Sarasota is located, where, we, where I am right now. We went down to Sarasota just to check it out. We went to the beach. There's a beautiful beach, the number one rated beach in the country. I don't know if you know that, Siesta Key Beach. And we bought a house there um, literally two or three months later and moved the whole thing down here very quickly. And then just started out of my garage at the house that I bought. Very quickly, I hired Andy Graber, who's um, many of you know. Mm-hmm. Um, he's the big fan of Andy. Yeah, very instrumental in 
having made the company what it is today, you know, really driving the product selection process at GetFBB. And, no, I mean, he makes great know. decisions, like buying a bunch of the Ladrib motors. That was <laughs> great, great thinking on his part. Which, which I believe are out of stock. Uh, Chad, we, you and I have to have a chat. It's like, yeah. where are they? Why are they not in stock? <laughs> We're working on it. We're working on it. Yeah, we're working on it. I'm sorry um, we can't keep the Ladrib motors up with demand. <laughs> I'm sorry that the Ladrib motors are selling so well. I'm sorry. You and me both. You and me both. We're, you know, it's great. It's a great product, of course. I mean, all kidding aside, it's a beautiful motor. I have one on my desk, actually, um, looking at it um, for its beauty. Um, anyway, coming back to what we were talking about. To, That's why we keep uh, Drew to, uh, around, by the way. <laughs> Anyway, coming back to Carlos, which is where we started this, mm -hmm. to just wrap up the story of how we met. So he was clearly pushing the envelope of what's possible, and he had a great talent for flying, but he's also an artist. I don't know if you know, I mean, you guys know, but I don't know if the audience knows that Carlos in his day job works at DreamWorks as an animator, um, and he's just an incredibly fun guy. Uh, you, I mean, you, the, the road ride crew that knows him from the videos knows that. Um, so I'm not telling you something you don't know. But um, so we just contacted him and said, "Hey, you're doing this incredible stuff. Have you heard of Lumineer?" And of course he had. Um, and we said, "Well, let's work together." You know, and we we became, you know, friends and uh, sponsored uh, him ever since then, and have made a lot of products with him, uh, for him under his name and, and have continued to really support what he's, what, he's, what he's after. So that's how we got to know each other and uh, met him, you know, at some point uh, much later. But, yeah, we're still very, very close to him and are working together. And So you've developed a lot of great products with him, the, the QAVR, Sharpoo edition, um, right? Yeah, um, the Sharpoo QAVR, yeah. The Sharpoo tape. Um, that he wraps his <laughs> quads. <laughs> that that he that he uh, worked on on by himself. So oh, he, I see. He, he I has, think it's just a relay. He did all the R and D, all the R and D he did on that tape, or the composition of the tape, color of what color he chose for the tape. Right. Of course, we're talking about regular electric tape, so which he wraps around <laughs> everything on the. Don't give away his secrets. <laughs> so Tim, <laughs> tell me. Technique. Tell me, um, what were the biggest, I mean, everything sounds like it just fell into place for you, but um, what were like the biggest challenges uh, starting uh, Lumineer, Get FPV, and just your whole transition into the corporate world, into a world where you, you, you think it's going to be big, it, it may not be, it's a, it's a really big gamble. What were the biggest challenges for you as, uh, as an entrepreneur? Well, it's a really good question. I think the generally what I always say when you're when you're trying to become an entrepreneur, there's it's always about risk, right? How much risk can you take on? Uh, that's why I think the whole vlogging of people quitting their day job to pursue FPV full time is is, is exists, right? The, the the reason why that's compelling is a question of risk of people that have a passion for something that are then taking on an enormous risk to pursue that passion, right? That's what quitting your day job means. You All of a sudden, your regular paycheck goes away and you have to make up for that somehow. And the, the, the situation that I was fortunate enough to be in was that I, like I said, I had a day job with Sony and I was able to grow this on my own from like 6 p.m. to, to 2 a.m. every day to a pretty sizable and meaningful um, revenue base, you know, even doing it within a few hours a day. And I knew just because I've done this before, I was an entrepreneur in the past and had sold a business. I knew I felt like 90% that if I just devoted more time to it, I could grow this even better. So, so, so really inspiring. So, oh, go ahead. My bad. So I, I mean, to answer the question, that wasn't that decision wasn't the hard part for me. It was there was other challenges, which is like how do you stay relevant? How do you make a relevant product? How do you make a product that people will want to buy? And how do you create high quality? You know how do you, you know how do you the day to day challenges? I think were really what I focused on more so than 
you know, should I do this or shouldn't I do this? And and you know what? I think because I, I don't think a lot of people know this, but I come from flying the Zephyr. Like that's how I got into flying FPV. I saw Trappy going down mountains and shoots right. down mountains um, about five years ago, and I wanted to fly these huge rigs. And then I remember my buddy had a quad, and I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. But he kept on crashing it, and it was something where if you crash it at once, that was it. You're going home. It, it's not surviving. And this is when they had like 400s and stuff like that. And I think what the turning point for me was – when I saw that you came out with, I think it was the QAV 250, which for me, I had never seen something that small and that durable. And that's what really pushed me into getting in, getting a quad. And, and no joke, it was, it was that and Carlos at the same time because his videos were just amazing. But it was that, that um, evolution in, in – the the frame and the durability to be able to fly these things and crash because imagine imagine going out and and spending all this money and you and you get to the field and you have one shot and and you're trying to learn how to fly there's no sims back then um it was a it was really hard to get into Mm -hmm. and that i think you're absolutely right and i started with the zephyr in my journey as well and i first flight i had a blackout the video crapped out and the Zephyr kept on flying, and it took me, there's a whole thread on FPV Lab, a whole story about how we mobilized a team of people to help me find it. We did a mission to fly over the, a huge area of New York City, by the way, um, to find this airframe, and we found it, and I recovered it. It's an incredible story. But you're right that with the advent of this, the frames getting smaller, they became a lot more durable. And so we spend a lot of time making them durable, these smaller frames, you know, QV 250, as, as, you're, as you're describing, was one of those. And it made flying just a lot more um, practical, you know. Like if you look at the 3D heli space, I don't know if you've ever flown a 3D heli, Maddie, have you? Uh, I've never, I never have. I've seen people do it, but it just wasn't my thing. I was always into planes. It's a horrifying and experience. As a, as a category, right, I mean, 3D helis were huge. Chad, how long ago would you say they were really at its peak? I, Eight years ago, ten years ago? Around the time flight test started, I think it was it was still pretty big. So about 2010. It, so if you ever flown a heli, which I have done once, right? I built, bought it, built it. You've come down just a little funny. And the blade hits the ground, you're, you're done. You're going to replace drive shafts and gearing. <laughs> it takes forever to get back together. So I think that's one of the reasons, in my estimation, why 3D helis are now a small fraction of the RC world than that they are today from, from where they started. The, the, and the smaller the frames gotten in the 250 size or even smaller, the frames are just much more durable. The carbon is so strong in relation to the size of the airframe that you can hit them really hard into a, a wall and they would still hold up. You may have to change a prop, but still overall um, a very robust little machine that you could just keep flying all day long. So yeah. that obviously, if you're going out to fly, for you guys being pilots, that makes a huge difference. It's just oh, yeah. much more enjoyable. It, it, it changed the, the whole game. Like it, it actually, it really did. Because... You need, like, I never thought, like, when I first, and uh, I'm sorry, Tim, but it, my very first frame was the, the X-Hover um, MX-230, <laughs> but and, it and was Daniel's only because he guy. had six-inch arms, and I wanted, because I always saw my buddies breaking things, and I was like, man, this one with the six in, or six mil arms would, um, seems like it would really hold up. And I remember getting this thing and crashing it over and over again. I'm like, how does how is this working? Like this is it. It really made it visible for me that the smaller frame would um, allow me to do the things I wanted to do with it, which was fly it all day. By the way, Daniel Sandoval, who now runs X Hover, which is a great company, I only have good things to say about Daniel. He started off as a Lumia pilot. I don't know if you. And yeah. Know that. No, I don't. I don't. I don't think I was around <laughs> back then. Maybe. 
Yeah, but, but it's a great story, right? Daniel, the same way. He, he, he felt as passionate about the hobby as I was. And he decided, you know what, I can do something in this space. And he became very successful doing what he's doing today. And I, you know, could, I, I love Daniel and he did great. And da Daniel and X Hover are another close friend of uh, the Rotor Riot fam. We do a lot of stuff with him. Uh, yeah. Recently, we were Daniel, out in California shooting episodes, hosting Quad Camp. It's great stuff. Daniel, from the reason. very beginning, I've always held him in high regards. Um, just a great, great person. Uh, I wish I could be in contact with him more, but unfortunately, we just don't really cross paths that much. But um, okay. definitely someone who I look at, and I, it brings me back to those first days where, you know, I'm I'm phoning him up and I'm like, should I get the Cobra motors or should I get the what were the yeah. Sunny Skies? Back then it was like the two motor. I'm like, which one should I get? And I'd phone him like five different times to ask him about one product. Um, yeah. But yeah. So well, I want a second so to give my endorsement to Daniel because just to speak to his character, <laughs> uh, you know, he he came to me with the idea of quad box. I don't know, last about a year ago or just under a year ago. And, um, you know, I was thinking of something similar and there's not a lot of people on this earth that would come to me like that. And I would just say, OK. And Daniel was one. I was like, do you, you feel like, you know, this would be a, a good pairing you and I to do this? And he's like, yeah, I'm like, OK, I'll do it. <laughs> and we pretty much did a handshake and and did it. And it's it's doing exceptionally well. And I attribute so much of that success to Daniel and his operations because, you know, X hovers always done well. Like nobody I know has a bad word to say about Daniel. So I, I just right. wanted to continue that endorsement. Hmm. Good. Maybe, can I go on a quick tangent on, as we're talking about people, we talked about Carlos, we talked about Dave Windestall, we talked about Daniel. Uh, you know, when, when I see, you know, these good people doing good work and their hearts in the right place, and they do good work and good products. That's when, you know, when I read a lot of the forum posts that many of them on Facebook, especially, as we all know, get very critical. They get very sort of down to really at a destructive level. Mm -hmm. And it's one thing when you talk about a product, you know, it's like, oh, this thing is bad or it's crap for the, you know, blah, blah, blah. But what hurts is when you know the people behind these products and you know how what good humans they are deep down and the work that they're doing to see them, the work that they put out be criticized in that way. I always find that it's, it hurts me. Oh, it hurts yeah. me Absolutely. About my that was our whole first episode of this the... podcast. We had a big section okay. on how uh, social media you know, kind of uh, leads people to be overly critical and, that all that behavior so it, and it is tough when you're on the other side all of a sudden and you know the behind the scenes <laughs> actually you know the people that, that work on it just yesterday um I, I i had to put my foot down because in the group as you know our, our group is getting rather large twenty five thousand in our facebook group and i've always been a big advocate of letting people express themselves um the problem is when they feel as though they that putting someone down or or rudely rejecting people's opinions in a very disrespectful way is somehow respect or you know expressing themselves so i so i just yesterday <laughs> really put my foot down in in the group and um and i don't care if it has to just be to my personal discretion i'm going to remove people when i see disrespectful behavior like that so um, that's what I like to hear. Yeah. I think that's what I think that's what that group really needs. It it you need to you need to take out the people that just aren't aren't trying to unite each other. Well, my yeah, my problem was was I I I like to run things with integrity. So if if it's good this way, it's good that way, you know, and that's how I try to function. But when people take advantage of that, I have to make exceptions to the rules and and that's where, you know, we are running it differently and, you know, if I get word of people being blatantly disrespectful, I don't care if they've technically followed the rules or not, they're out. Yep. So, so I want to get this refocus. We've gone so off. So Tim, a we had a yeah, great... I got a question. Oh. I got a question for Tim actually. What what would you say? Because I mean, with your whole story that you've told me, I I didn't I, I knew a little bit of it. I I remember hearing you on a podcast about two and a half years ago when I first got into it, it was like the first week, and I was still waiting for my like stuff to arrive. 
you went on a podcast or just did like a, a video interview with Carlos. Do you remember that one? With flight test, right? Oh, maybe that was what it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that yeah. that was actually what it was. Yeah. So that's that's the last time I really remember you um, in in an environment like that where you were explaining your journey through the the hobby and just hearing from you now it 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 seems like you we shared a lot of the same thing like I would go to work and just my passion for this I would work 10 hour days and then I would get off work and and put everything into it again right um but what I wanted to what I want to ask you is what do you think your biggest achievement was with um with what you've done so far well i think i mean having been able to establish uh two brands in the space i i think that uh, i consider that an achievement um you know it's always um amazing when you hear people talking about their experience with get fpv and you know how they got something resolved the problem that they had and how quickly it got resolved and how much enjoyment they got out of working with our customer support team and, you know, the, the feedback that they have that is overwhelmingly positive. You know, obviously there's people that have a bad experience. You know, I wouldn't say that we're perfect. We're not. It's all humans behind the scenes again, like tying back to what we said earlier. But I think generally when I read the overwhelming feedback from people that have experienced positive experience with get FPV and Lumineer, um, that to me, I consider that a great accomplishment that I'm very, very proud of. Um, so, you know, that at the end of the day, that's really what leaves a mark in the industry. You know, when I walk around drone races and I see people using aluminum motors or using a, Q, a QAV airframe or whatever, you know, seeing our gear in the field is, is incredibly enjoyable and get then the feedback is the second piece. Yeah. yeah that's well, awesome. thanks. So that was an awesome so far kind of history lesson. It was more, Kind of even inspiring than I knew. Um, kind of hearing about the the evolution of the hobby and the birth and the growth of Get FPV and Lumineer. I want to shift to some current events. So we talked about how fast Lumineer and Get FPV grew. And earlier this year, there was a big uh, acquisition. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So <clears throat> when I, you know, when you take Every sort of six months, I look at the space and I look at our business and how it's doing and how the business is doing, the industry is doing overall. And it became clear to me a little over a year ago that if we wanted to continue growing, something had to change. Because the drone phenomenon as a whole <clears throat> it sort of took off in an incredibly aggressive way, in a good way. Um, but there was much more to drones as an industry than just FPV and, and drone racing. And I wanted to make sure that our companies are positioned in that transformation. And it became clear that there's a lot more money being poured into this, um, you know, companies raising VC capital, um, you know, and, and so forth that I felt, you know what, if, if we don't have access to a capital in fusion, we may not be able to grow and continue to grow at the pace that we need to. So that's the point in time when I started at looking at strategic partnerships. And when you're looking at that, there's really two types. That so that was probably at. a year before the actual deal was made, you, you made this decision? Yes. So it took a year from deciding, okay, we need capital investment, that decision right. was made, and then a year goes to actually into making that partnership happen. That's okay. right. Um, and, and there's two, when you, when you set out, what I did was I hired a banker, an investment banker, um, that knows how to run a process like that and knows what you need to do to, to get ready for a transaction like that. And we looked at two, there's two principal ways you can go. One is a strategic partner, which is similar to what I did when I sold my first company. I had a ringtone technology company at the time that was very good at taking a piece of music and transcoding it for hundreds of different handsets. And we pitched this to Sony Music, and Sony Music has a huge catalog of music, obviously, and they felt that that piece that we've built strategically fit very well with what they wanted to do. So they acquired my company at that time. That was a strategic acquiring a company. 
And the other is a financial. So a financial partner would be somebody that would come in and they want to put capital at risk and see if they can grow it. And that category for my type of company is the private equity industry, right? Private equity, there's private equity and then there's public equity. If you go public, an IPO, you're selling yourself to the public market and you're raising capital that way. Very difficult to do that now. Uh, there's not many IPOs uh, happening these days. Um, but luckily, the, the private equity market, so the private capital, is very robust. And there's thousands of private equity firms that raise money from institutions or you know, um, individuals or other sources. And they then deploy that capital to buy. They buy companies to then grow them and at some point sell them. And that's how they make a return. So we did the private equity route. So we, um, in September, sold a majority of the, of the company to a private equity firm out of Chicago. And I'm still a major shareholder. I'm still the CEO of the business. But I now have, I call them my rich uncle <laughs> that sits behind us, that you know, the company that we sold to has $380 million uh, under management that they have to put to work by buying and investing in businesses such as mine to help them grow to the next level. So that's what we did um, in September, in late September, and it's been great so far. Yeah, I was I was really happy to see you stay involved in, this, in a in a industry as kind of small as ours. These sort of things that may be more typically behind the scenes do get talked about by the actual customers. So when the acquisition happened, I remember seeing a lot of chatter about it. And there were some people say, oh, what a sellout. And it's like, guys, he bought right back in. It's awesome. Yeah. So you stayed, you stayed perfectly invested. Um, you know, and, and the re- that's awesome. right. And, and some people say, Why, why'd you sell? Why'd you get out? It's like, I'm not out. I'm going to work every day. I'm this, you know, I have a huge amount of equity still at, at risk, right? I mean, we talked about risk before. And now, though, I feel a much more p- better position to actually, over the course of the next five years, to make Lumineer not only a big player in FPV and drone racing, um, but also in the commercial drone space. And when you think about the commercial drone space, I'm a believer that in five years, if you look out the window, no matter where you are, even urban environments, you're gonna see drones zipping around every, every minute of the day, doing all kinds of different things, delivering Chad's toothbrush order from Amazon or, or, or uh, Drew's uh, hair dye order from Amazon as well. I got to go there. Or I, I, I got to go there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds a little crazy still, but it will happen. In my mind, no question of if, it's a question of when and how, right? And when that, when that moment happens, I want to have the company be fully ready to deploy uh, brushless motors and powertrains for those types of applications. But there's a thousand other ones, you know, search and rescue and, you know, inspections of cell towers and pipelines and bridges and roofs. And we love bridge inspection. (laughs) (laughs) Yours is slightly different types of inspection than what I'm what I'm thinking about. But yes, high speed bridge inspection. The world needs it. (laughs) I'm there. The world does need it. (laughs) So so, so expand. So you've got you you. You got the money, quote unquote, right? Yeah. What, what, how do you plan to put it to work? A uh, big part of what you're saying is expanding into the commercial space. Right. And and also then, how, how do you go about that? So a couple of years ago, a little over two years ago, I started establishing a factory in, in China because I wanted to be, I saw what was happening back then, which was the Chinese, you know, they compete on price. They will make, you know, when you're making a motor and selling it for $25, they will make one and sell it at you know, $15, then $10, then $9, then $8. <laughs> right. Well, that's how the Chinese operate, right? And I felt, you know, look, if I really want to be in the market for a long time, I may as well realize that that's what's going to happen. And I better be able to compete with that long term. Well, the only way to do that is, well, I have to have a, f- a factory in China that I own 100%. So a few years ago, I started that journey and went to China and started looking around and started hiring people and started establishing a factory in China that is now cranking out many, many thousands of motors a month 
um, and, and axial antennas are fabricated there, and our propellers are being made there, and, and so, so on. So, so you own the you own the OEM production of your own products. That's, that's a, right. That's a big deal. You it's a big deal conceptually because I'm not relying on some vendor that I have to beg to make my products and call them and say, hey, you're late a week. It's like they have a thousand other clients and they don't care. You know? All right, you made your point. We- We're late. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, and you know what? I think that's always been a big challenge with this this industry is if if there's a great product out there, Usually, the smaller companies don't have the resources to keep up, and, um, and and it's great that you're able to do this to keep your customers supplied all the time. Because everyone knows this this uh, this struggle. You go to the field, you're down to your last motor, and what do you do? Smash something, explode, you know, and all of a sudden your rig's down if you only have one rig. Um, and, and you usually have to wait for, for either the mail or, or the product to come back in stock. And keeping it in stock was always a challenge. And, you know, we, we addressed it by setting up our own factory. But now that we're, you know, with this private equity, um, relationship that we have growing the China facility is a big effort. Um, and there's lots of things you can do to grow and it costs money to do so. And. And that's what we're engaging in now. I'm actually going to China again in in, uh, in a week um, to to keep pushing that forward. So, Tim, there's um, two topics surrounding this right now, kind of like the market, the size of the market. I guess two questions that I want to run by you, and I, and I apologize, it's a little bit of a setup, but uh, as far as how I'm going to explain it, um, I did a, a, a vlog video about uh, the hype cycle, and um, and I believe currently we're in this trough of disillusionment. And, and what that is, is, you know, initially when technology emerges, and in this case, it was the, I would say the five to six inch mini quad. So it's not one piece of technology, but it was a collection of technology that made something possible. And it's the type of flight that, you know, we're all doing now, or not me, but some of these guys. <laughs> and uh, um So that emerged, and what happened was, you know, two years ago, there were three motors to choose from, Lumineer being one of them, (laughs) and uh, and now there's 200 motors to choose from. So even though I say the market continues to grow, what happens is there was a surge of suppliers and manufacturers that divide that growing market up, so everybody's sliver gets smaller. But what happens is if you are one of those suppliers that made sales very easily a year ago, it's much harder to make that same sale today. So to that manufacturer, it looks like the industry is shrinking. And reality, it is still growing. It's just not growing at the rate that the new manufacturers and suppliers have entered. Um, Tim, do you do you agree with that? Do you see it similar to that? I do, Chad. I do agree that um, the market is growing, but it's not growing fast enough to sustain um, or to make grow all these new entrants in either the manufacturing space for for motors or any component for that matter, and or retail. You know, there's a lot of retailers now um, selling this type of gear that weren't there uh, a couple of years back. So that challenge is one where you have to, you know, you have to accept that and you have to sort of work your way through that. Um, I think that the, the, the mark, any, any industry will go through these cyclical events like the housing market, right? Goes up, comes down, comes back up, goes back down. And ultimately you have to sort of step back and look at, you know, 30 years in the residential housing market to see a trend that goes up Mm -hmm. even though we had a huge correction uh in 2008 um it's still growing even though it comes down goes back up and i think the 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 space that we're collectively are in drone racing and fpv it's just not long enough to be able to step back you know to look at it decades over decades there hasn't been a decade of (laughs) fpv and drone racing yet maybe even you know, barely half a decade. So 
So I think what we're seeing now is this first, you know, slowdown in this mm-hmm. cyclical evolution. Um, I'm of the opinion that there's lots of growth left in the space. Ultimately, there will be a correction where some of the entrants that went into the space to do something, maybe sell, be a retailer, they just can't get to the mass that is required to really make it grow. So they want to, they will, I, th- I think some of them will just step back out of it. Uh, and so it's the same with some of the companies, you know, that have seen incredible growth, um, you know, in the earlier years, they may have to change or, or do something differently. Um, so, so that, here- that so I agree. I agree with you. Does that make sense? What I was yeah, describing? it makes it makes perfect sense. It's it's very much um, how how I see it. Um, now the second part to that question, and and I had a lot of people don't know this, but or maybe they do, but I've I've worked in marketing for over twenty years, really, video production and marketing, and so I had the opportunity throughout the years to see this cycle in other companies, in other niches, and other markets. Um, so I just anticipated and assumed it would happen in this market. The variable being not knowing how long these phases would last. Um, that's something uh, just about nobody can predict and nobody has has accurately. Um, but thinking that we're going to skip a phase is not realistic because that never happens. It always has the downturn. You don't have a spike without a downturn. And right. um, now the oh, the big question just mark like that... Bitcoin, Maddie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, really keep quick going, this. Chad. Don't let don't let it go. Just keep going. You, Chad. Why did you do that? Please. I'm trying Tim, to just. Go I just on. want to ask Tim. <laughs> as a very smart businessman, would you throw money if you had dispensable money at Bitcoin? If you knew how to play the market. Uh, to me, it's it's it's. It's overvalued, right? It's it's we are at such an aggressive growth, at such a peak. Now, can this continue for another six months, twelve months? Maybe I don't know. But I, I know think there'll be that. a correction. But um, there are the some point, right? absolute some business opportunities, Tim. I'd like to talk to you about after the podcast. <laughs> Investment <laughs> opportunities that I can Chad, show Chad, you. Chad, bring it in. Bring it in, Chad. Take it back. I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't can't hey, believe guys, you did we, that, Drew. Get, I'm sorry. Can we get to some controversy here? Are we allowed to? Wait, wait. Well, uh, let me let me just finish this. This this is let probably the one question I was looking most forward to for this this podcast. So. Okay, given the state of things and where we're at, I think what is happening right now is there are some very talented people that have businesses and they are suppliers and they're bringing innovation, um, but might not necessarily share the, that view that we just discussed. And um, they're, they're not, they may not be running their business as such to be able to compensate for that law. And my fear is that we lose some talent in this industry because of that is there (laughs) you probably don't want to answer this but is there an opportunity that maybe these companies will start grouping together you know i.e you know lumineer is lumineer looking are you gonna buy tim yeah are you gonna buy other companies i you know i can't speak to the specifics but i can tell you that in this industry of private equity investing, what often happens in any industry, any acquisition that these types of institutional investors will do, for them to see, to have a return on their investment, right? If you think about it, they're buying a company for $5, five years later, they're gonna sell it for $10. They made $5. For them to bulk up a business, you know, to make the EBITDA line item grow, the, 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 which is what they're using as how to value a business, oftentimes they will do what's called add-on investments or add-on acquisitions to combine two different companies, A plus B, and together they can produce more than individually that they're, they would have been valued at. So that, that is a strategy and it's something that we are looking at, but I can't tell you the specifics of what we're going after, what we're looking at. Um, <clears throat> I, I think generally, though, in a market that's seeing a correction, which I think the, the FPV slash drone racing space is, is in right now, if you can find companies that together can can merge and therefore have more bulk, it helps to sustain. Because if you think about it just from a high level, if you're a company and you have a controller and an HR person and a whatever, 
if you were to merge together, you may still only need one HR person and one controller, right? So you just took out a lot of cost of running your business. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the principal ideas of, of merging companies together and you get benefit uh, by, by doing that. So I think there's definitely in a correction ever more so the need to look at for companies, small companies to look at, hey, what can I do to sustain a period of correction or, or, or flat growth, um, you know, which you need money to do that or, or lower your cost to do that. So yes, for companies to combine, merge or, you know, bulk up some other ways, it's definitely one way to do that. Take cost out is one, one way. No, yeah, Tim. I've just been saying that for a while, and I'm curious if it's actually playing out. So, Tim, you are on the unrestricted podcast. Okay, what happened? What happened with this whole VTX thing? Are we allowed to talk about that? Sure, it's pub it's public record. Uh, it was it was issued the whole. I think the FCC published the whole consent decree that we had to sign. We can absolutely talk about it. I have my thoughts on it for sure um i'm not Wait, what is it uh, so so just so explain just, maybe to yeah. the our uh, listeners to what happened if if uh people out there don't really know what what happened with this whole situation right so the the fcc is the federal communications commission and they're in charge for governing and regulating um any radio frequency thing uh in the united states so if you want to make a a car key like mine that like we all carry around in our pockets that that you press a button and your car unlocks that goes over the airways and so you will have um, to get a license from the FCC and register your device with the FCC uh, to be able to to do that and they will look at like wh what is your device how much power does it transmit um, or radiate and what frequencies it's on, is it on. And if there's a frequency that it's on that they don't want you to transmit on because it interferes with air traffic control or some other system, they will tell you, well, you can't get a registration for this because you have to change it to a different frequency or, or different power level. So that's what the FCC does. Very valuable work, important, um, absolutely required for us to have safety when we're flying in commercial airliners or, or relying on the police to be able to talk to each other on, on radios, etc. What happened with us and FPV in generally, generally was, it was such a new space. Um, we all rely on small video transmitters that transmit the picture from the frame to, to the pilot. And we use a radio that we use to control the airframe so transmitting from the ground to the airframe to tell it which way we want to go. Those radios typically, like a Horizon or a Futaba radio, they all have FCC registrations, right? So they're fully authorized by the FCC to do that. There is an amateur um, segment of what, what the FCC allowed, allows, which is if you want to be at home with a ham radio, for example, and talk to friends far, far away, you can do that, but you have to get a license similar to what you would need to drive a car, get a driver's license. For this, you need a ham technician's license that the FCC will, you know, give you if you pass the test. And that's the, the framework that we in FPV use for people to be able to have these small transmitters that don't, they can't get an FCC registration like my car key example or, you know, any other device that the FCC authorizes because they're operating on, on, a, on frequencies that the FCC doesn't want the average consumer to, 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 to be using. So you need to have this, this ham license to be able to do it. What happened then was when we buy these, these transmitters from China in the early days, there wasn't a lot of clarity, at least in, in my mind, it was, you know, people could say, well, you should have read, out, read, read more about it. And yes, that's true, I was doing a million other things. There was transmitters that had in the 5.8 spectrum, for example, that were operating just on the edge of what's permissible. And in some cases, just slightly outside the frequency range that the FCC deems to be auth auth authorized for this amateur radio spectrum use. And we've been selling a lot of those transmitters that were just outside um, and we were always very clear about on our website, 
what frequencies are these transmitters transmitting on. We didn't make a secret out of it because, frankly, we didn't think we were doing anything illegally. We always would notify the user on the web page that they're buying the product from. It says, for you to be able to use this transmitter, you must have a ham technician's license. Otherwise, you're doing it illegally, like driving a car without a driver's license. So we felt that because of that requirement that the user has to have a ham license, the user should know exactly what frequencies they can and cannot use in the United States. So while the transmitter may be on the edge of the permissible band and slightly outside in some cases, we felt it was okay because we put the onus on the consumer to make sure that they know which frequency they can and can't use. Which, fast forwarding to what happened in the last six months, the FCC took issue with. And they, uh, early in the year, I want to say March or April, sent us a letter that said, hey, we got word that you're selling illegal equipment that broadcasts outside of what's permissible. We need to know everything that you've sold for the last year and tell us the numbers and tell us what frequencies it's on, And which we did. We complied. We gave them all the details um, because the details were always fully available on the website. And they then decided to fine us a significant fine of $180,000 for having sold transmitters that are outside of what they deem is permissible. You know, it stinks. And what, what, what I'm frustrated by is that if somebody from their, their office would have told me, hey, by the way, this one and this one is not permissible because of this and that reason, don't do it, or we will fine you, I would have gladly complied. You know, we would have gladly taken the equipment down and not continued to sell it. Do you However, think they, they were making an example? With 100%. They picked the biggest company in the space. They went after us very hard, slapped us with a very large fine, um, and they're using it to promote that they're now really focused on, on that. And I know of other retailers that are going through the same thing that we did, and I'm sure they will get fined also, which, you know, as a, as a, as a bureaucracy, as, as the FCC, you want to ensure compliance, right? And we would have gladly complied, and we did so immediately when we got their letter. Um, we would have complied the same way if the fine was $0, $5, $180,000, or $2 million. The, our compliance would have been the same. So it's just unfortunate that a small U.S.-based business hiring local American employees is already challenged by what's happening in China and coming from China and will continue to come from China, right? What happened to us will not change a user going to Banggood and buying a $15 transmitter that doesn't comply with the FCC rules. It will still come into the U.S. And really all they're doing is hurting us in the U.S. when the Chinese have no risk of ever being caught by them or being forced to modify what what they're doing and what they're selling to a U.S. customer. So you Tim, know what's crazy? Okay. You, you know what's crazy? And I may get crucified for this, but it's crazy that you can sell a video transmitter that had what, how many channels was it? I heard it was like two channels that were two. over the limit. Yeah, a couple channels. The, the outside channels, the bottom and the top. So a couple channels on our 5.8 video transmitters. The company who sells them will be fined. But you guys don't have any gun regulations down there. <laughs> we should... We, that is talking a whole other podcast. Like, is it? Is it really though? Politics, and I, I don't. I, I won't go there. Well, I, hold on. I, I, it's I, just, I, it's just crazy because like even, even the other day, I, I did a Insta live stream and I was under a bridge trying to fly. My rig wasn't working. I don't know what the hell's wrong with it. So, I, um, anyways, there's these guys that were flying, are uh, driving these huge trucks, like the biggest, uh, like twenty five hundred dollar, huge, huge trucks, and. They're like, yeah, we were in a park the other day, and and uh, we actually hit someone with one of these. And I'm like, are there no rules for where you can, you know, do this? And they're like, no, we can do it wherever we want. 
and just the rules, the rule, everyone just has to settle down the rule makers in the, in the FPU PV world, I think. So Maddie, you're bringing up apples and oranges though, because uh, what Tim's talking about is an established rule that was broken where gun regulations, that's, there are regula certain regulations, like you can't just go out on the street and shoot someone. Um, and if that rule's broken, then there will be a repercussion for it. Yeah, I don't know. I was just uh, I was trying to stir the pot a little bit. There. <laughs> Tim's not having it, so <laughs> we'll have to we'll have to do another one for for guns and in bitcoins. Uh, so real quick, Tim, you haven't ever mentioned the product. Uh, is it public knowledge, or are you not allowed to say, or do you prefer not to say what product it was? It was a whole array of of different transmitters. I mean, we've been in this. That's the other challenge we have. You know, we've been at this for. The longest or one of the longest in, in terms of selling this equipment so we've sold over the years probably what a hundred different transmitters and a good chunk of those were um, affected by this rule and you know we've since taken them out consumers don't really care because there's lots of other choices that you know don't have that particular problem the other thing i want to say is that you know, it's about, at the end of the day, the SEC does it out of consumer safety, right? They're doing it because they want to ensure safety for you and I flying on commercial airliners that require that nothing gets, there's no interference with what the aircraft needs and the communication channels need, et cetera. 100% get that, 100% agree with that, and I'm glad that they're there doing what they're doing. For us, though, you know, we haven't heard of one interference that, one of these edge frequencies or one of these transmitters has has caused you know not not one in in over five years in the business having sold many 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 thousands of these transmitters um, so it's it's if there if there was an ongoing issue where you know there was ongoing interference I get that you know you have to find us one hundred eighty thousand you know but the lack thereof is it, it shows me that the, the number is so large again to make it a concern for other businesses in the space that uh, may have sold transmitters that are at issue to just uh, make make the point that hey we will we will come after you and it was unfortunate to be the, the how, you know, I mean the, how, the how this all works is is a bit beyond me it just it does seem odd that they would find the retailer right where. Okay, you're using the automotive analogy earlier. So General Motors makes a Corvette that can go 200 miles an hour. The dealer sells it. The driver makes the determination whether or not they exceed 60 mile an hour limit. In this analogy, to, to, in this analogy they're finding the dealership, right? So well, don't worry about the manufacturer that created the car that goes 200 miles an hour. Don't worry about the customer that violated their driver's license. We're going to go after the dealership that sold it. It's, it's weird. Yeah, and, and Drew, you did what I was trying to do with the whole gun thing, but you did it way better and actually made it like well, just in America. Like, don't talk less about controversial. Guns. Yeah, it was that was a great that was a great one. <laughs> yeah, it's, look at the end of the day, there you know the SEC has a framework that they use and um, rules, and it, one of the rules is that you can't market. They call it a marketing rule. You can't market products that don't comply. Um, and that's what we were falling under. Uh, they would go after the manufacturer also. Um, but in this case, the, the, the particular um, framework that they, and the rule that they were finding us under was the marketing rule, that you cannot market a device that doesn't comply with the FCC. Are, are you allowed to dispute this? Um, not anymore. So what happens is we, you know, hired an attorney, a law firm out of Washington that deals with these matters. And, um, you could go a couple different ways. If you don't agree with what their, the FCC is going after you for, um, you could say, well, I'm going to take my chances and I'm going to let this go into the ju judicial system. And ultimately the FCC would have to, um, file, um, uh, a notice of apparent liability is what it's called, and it would go to a U.S. court, a judge would then pick it up, and they would decide whether or not the FCC is right and you did break the law, and if so, how much the fine should be um, or not. And it's, again, a matter of risk, right? 
I felt that our case was very good. You know, we, we really didn't do anything malicious. We didn't want to break the law. Um, it turns out that we did, but it was really not under a, uh, an attempt to do so. And we would have gladly complied if somebody would have just, just told us. However, you, you lose control in that process. Now you're at, at risk that the FCC will, A, instead of 180,000, they will ask for 1.8 million, right? And the judge may have a good day and a bad day. Um, they may agree with your case or they may agree more with the FCC's case. It's not under your control. And that risk of the fines going into the millions, I didn't want to take. It was right. just too much risk to take. And what we decided to do, which companies do regularly then, is to sign what's called a consent decree, which is what we did. And the consent decree will tell you, these are all the things that you need to do. This is the fine that you need to pay and when you need to pay it. This is you, the rules that you need to set up in your company to prevent these things from happening in the future. You know, we have a compliance officer now in the company that's responsible to ensure that any transmitters that we sell do not violate these rules in the future. And then we have to send reports to the FCC um, and, and to, val you know, to show that we're working on and, and have policies in place to prevent this from happening in the future. And therefore, we get this reduced fee <laughs> of 180000 um, and don't have any further risk uh, being prosecuted by them um, in the future. But also, we, we are really not at, at liberty to dispute it. I mean, we agreed to the consent decree, and we'll, we have all intentions of, of doing so. Hmm. So that is very thorough, Tim. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> that was, that's <laughs> awesome to thorough. learn about that. So, you got your shit together, Tim. I want to try one more time. Can you tell me the most popular video transmitter that was on that list? Honestly, I, I, I couldn't. It would be not because I don't want to. I just don't remember. There was literally... A, a sort of a hodgepodge of, of over 30 name three that, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can three tell you random. a Lumineer transmitter was, was definitely on the list you know we sold a lot of transmitters that we make with uh, under a partnership we don't design the electronics ourselves um, so there, there's definitely all the, all the many of the major brands would have been on, on that list Lumineer including um, but so, most of them you know are sort of originated in China um, that we bought in and retail retailed. Okay. So, well, I guess that's fair enough. <laughs> Again, if you I mean, go to, go to uh, web archive and look at transmitters that we sold <laughs> in, in, and in see which ones aren't years, there anymore, <laughs> which ones aren't there anymore. I honestly, if I, you know, if you're really interested, I could come up with a list and send it to you an email. Okay. I, I'm just curious. So, um, okay, well, I think we've, we've gone um, about an hour, and that's usually what we shoot for, and we've, we've covered quite a bit. And, Tim, I, I think uh, it's, it's really great every time we chat. I, I learn more, and, uh, and I'm, I'm most thankful you. for your openness and, um, and in the very detailed way that you explain things. It's, it's, it's always helpful to me, and I always learn, so I appreciate that, and thank you. Yeah, and Tim, I'd like to thank you for your time. Uh, we all know that you're very busy and you're very um, you're very focused on running Lumineer Get FPV. Well, whatever crazy venture you're you're getting yourself into, so I appreciate your time. Uh, and thank you so much for um, being able to you know supply people with uh, the parts they need so they can do the hobby they love. Thank you guys for for giving me the time and. Maybe in response to what the kind words you just said, I want to say that I'm a huge fan of Rotoride. I frequently wear my Rotoride shirt to the office. I have, I think, three different ones. Um, so I have variety there. I think what you what you're doing, which is really sort of the evolution of what I started my whole journey into FPV with, which was FPV manuals. Mm -hmm. you you're just doing it bigger and better with better content, great pilots to really showcase. Which is really, at the end of the day, most hobbies are like that, that people will look up to the pilots like Drew and Maddie that do stuff that I don't even know how they're doing it. Um, and people want to learn through that experience. And I think what you're doing is, is great. The products that you started to put together are phenomenal. We, ha we love selling them on, on Get FPV. Uh, they sell very quickly, you know, always. And, and that's a great thing for us as a, as a retailer. 
um, and they give us motivation on the Lumineer product design side to, to do things bigger and better also. And I always appreciate good, good solid competition. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of what you guys are doing. Yeah, make sure to check out the Rotor Riot store to see the very popular Lumineer products like the Schizo Frame, the, the Schizo Motors, the, well, I guess maybe not that transmitter anymore. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, props, all the all the amazing uh, the antennas. The I love the Axie antennas. I'm a big. Those are my new favorite antennas. And make sure to check out the Get FPV store to see all of Rotor Ride products, like the Umagod Remix <laughs> and the exceedingly popular the Drip Motor. <laughs> well, the Umagod Motors too. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, those launched too. Yeah, the gold ones. Yeah, to go with that Remix frame, the matching gold motors. Right. Check those out. <laughs> the other motor. Yeah, I forgot they launched That's at the cool. same time. <laughs> Yeah, of course. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> Maddie, you want to wrap us up? Yeah. So, um, thanks, everyone, for joining us this week. Um, what I really wanted to bring Tim uh, Nielsen on the show for is I think that a lot of people that are coming into this hobby that are new um, uh, don't really realize the struggles that we, we had when we first started flying. And... Um, and uh yeah i think that it was uh a great chat and i guess join us next time when when's the next one coming out still figuring out the release schedule because we're recording them fast and trying to crank them out in all the places that you can consume them um itunes google play coming soon stitcher and spotify or maybe by the time this is out stitcher and spotify will be sorted out and of course our youtube channel where you can leave the comments that we will see the most immediately and see our beautiful faces well, also, on YouTube, if you do get YouTube Red, you can listen to YouTube like a podcast. You can turn your phone off, or not off, but you can shut it, shut the screen off and still listen to it if you have YouTube Red. Yeah, and then you don't see commercials on any of your favorite channels. Yep. And- YouTube, just, YouTube just has to consolidate. This, this whole, like, going to another site for podcasts, it, just do it on fucking YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, guys. Unrestricted in your ass. Thanks for. (laughs) (laughs) Is that going to be our new? Is that going to be our new exit? I highly doubt it.